Hey there everyone, AJ back again for the Mighty Gluestick channel. I make videos about Dungeons and Dragons lore full time and have a huge collection of videos on monster ecology, fantasy world history, cosmology, character classes and magic items on my channel. If you like what I do, please consider becoming a member of the channel by clicking the join button below or backing me on Patreon where you can get access to all of the scripts I write for these vids if you prefer to read what I'm saying. I also have a Discord server with an active community and of course subscribe to me here as I upload at least two videos per week with a live stream once a week as well. Wear sharks, often requested by viewers, certainly not something you ever want to run into unprepared. So let's dive into the lore, shall we? First off, wear sharks are lycanthropes and obey the usual rules for these cursed creatures. So a humanoid creature can be afflicted with the curse of lycanthropy after being wounded by a lycanthrope, or if one or both of its parents are lycanthropes. A removed curse spell can rid an afflicted lycanthrope of the curse, but a natural born lycanthrope can be freed of the curse only by use of a wish spell. A lycanthrope can either resist its curse or embrace it. By resisting the curse, a lycanthrope retains its normal alignment and personality while in humanoid form. It's, it lives its life as it always has, burying deep and bestial urges raging inside it. However, when the full moon rises, the curse becomes too strong to resist transforming the individual into its beast form or into a horrible hybrid form that combines animal and humanoid traits. When the moon wanes, the beast within can be controlled once again, especially if the cursed creature is unaware of its condition. It might not remember the events of its transformation, though these memories often haunt a lycanthrope as bloody dreams. Some individuals see little point in fighting the curse and accept what they are. With time and experience, they learn to master their shape-shifting ability and can assume beast form or hybrid form at will. Most lycanthropes that embrace their bestial natures succumb to the bloodlust, becoming evil, opportunistic creatures that prey on the weak. Were sharks are absolutely in the latter category. It's extremely rare for them not to succumb to the savage insects. Even in humanoid form, they tend to be cruel and arrogant. A stereotypical encounter with a were shark would take place in a dockside area of a city port. Some run down alleys between locked up and ramshackle warehouses with stinking fishing nets draped overhead. An even worse smell would waft like a foul mist before the player characters found the open barn-like doors of an oversized slaughterhouse. A great big metal cauldron steaming away as it renders down a thick porridge of fat and oil from the blubber of whales. The bones of the great animals forming some of the support structures for the building extending right back over the water's edge with ramps leading down into the sea. Great hooked blades on the ends of sturdy poles stacked in blood-spattered barrels. Black smoke from fires burning off waste fats and smoky great hunks of fly-covered meat hanging in great strips down from the rafters high overhead. And just visible through the haze, a broad-shouldered man, his bald head marked with a jagged scar so deep it looks like it goes to the bone. He turns and peers behind him, a greasy, wet red hand wipes a foam of gore from his lips as large white teeth gnaw on a hunk of meat. Pitch black eyes glint with the flickering light. He doesn't call out to ask who's there, he just sniffs the air and reaches a muscular arm over to one of the barrels and picks up a wicked curved dagger with a jagged serrated inside edge. He gulps down the meat, eyes momentarily flashing white as they roll back in his head. And then he grins, stepping back into the shadows, only the gleam of his eye is visible. There's a violent splash from the unseen water as the man's companions tear into the rest of a dead whale floating in the water. Stepping back into the shadows, in the darkness, the were shark could use its polymorph ability to shapeshift into a hybrid form of part man, part shark. Doing so gives them access to the special 30 foot blind sense they have. Plus, it now has a bite attack and its armor class increases thanks to the thick, abrasive shark hide. The lore of Forgotten Realms states that were sharks can only shapeshift in darkness, within reason, so not directly in the sun unless there is a total eclipse going on. Some say the original source of the curse was from the gods Talos or Umberly, who may have granted them this monstrous fate to their followers because the evil individuals asked for and earned it while others believe that humans that survive horrific shark attacks sometimes gain the ability to shapeshift into one of the creatures and are never the same again. What is certain is that nobody who knows the truth about an individual with this curse is ever comfortable around them, even for a moment again. It is a loathsome thing to be a lycanthrope, 
and with the Wear Sharks, it carries the completely justified reputation of being a cold-blooded killer as well. The best listing for the Wear Shark in 5th edition comes to us courtesy of the excellent 450 page source book from publisher Legendary Games titled The Pirate Campaign Compendium. You can pick up a PDF from Drive-Thru RPG or a print copy, I'll link that down below. It's a fantastic book, a must have if you want to run a bit of Cthulhu and Cannonballs packed with content and just gorgeous. So I do hope it's okay with the company if I show page 285 here and talk about it. In either humanoid or hybrid form, a shark is generally burly. It has a mouthful of unusually large teeth, and it typically has a personality that is both crude and bullying. They're bloodthirsty and very easy to anger. They will jump into fights they have no stake in just to snap bones and draw blood. sharks prefer life at sea or in port settlements, commonly frequented by seagoing merchants and pirates. They can be found leading pirate gangs or loitering at seaside taverns accompanied by crowds of toadies. Since they get into fights so often, they try to stick close to the sea so they can escape into the water if they bite off more than they can chew. The other members of the Wearshark's crew learn quickly that the boss is bound to skip out without much notice once a bigger fish comes along. So we have a challenge rating 6 individual monster. But I know from Forgotten Realms lore that while they normally operate solo, they can pair up with other sharks and form a hunting pack of up to five. Plus, they can attract other normal sharks, a bit like companion animals. These sharks with a Sahuagin origin may even be able to speak to and command the sharks directly. In earlier editions, sharks could communicate with all forms of shark. So, a couple of sharks and a posse of challenge rating 2 hunter sharks can be a significant threat in the water. A wharf shark that is facing a fight with some well-armed and skilled adventurers is certainly smart enough to use its formidable strength to grab and hurl an opponent into the water right into the thrashing feeding frenzy of a bunch of sharks. Wear sharks can still speak in their hybrid form, barely, but speech is impossible in full shark form. They can breathe either air or water in any form. In earlier editions the humanoid form could breathe underwater for up to an hour. There's no limit to the shark form breathing water, so yes, they can lunge completely out of the water onto the deck of a boat and attack, using its next action to shapeshift into a hybrid form. And they can swim through liquids that they can't breathe in shark form, rising to take breaths of air instead. I don't want to think about it too much, but this applies to particularly noxious sewer systems. Since where sharks don't have to bother worrying about normal diseases, like all lycanthropes, they can only be harmed by weapons of magic or silver, even when they're in uh, humanoid form. When in humanoid form, where sharks thankfully can only pass on their curse directly through their blood. Um, a rare and wicked poison of this sort is made from where shark blood. Giants can be afflicted with lycanthropy. They can transform into a giant shark, a megalodon. And I simply can't make a video about were sharks without talking about the most legendary one on the world of Toril. I'll read the wiki article about him, containing information sourced from Rising Tide, published by TSR in 1999, uh, written by Mel Odom. According to the peaceful Lokatha race, their legends state that the ancient were shark Iacovis emerged from the sea in human form at the beginning of the Days of Thunder, so we're talking like 30,000 years ago, looking for another like himself. He dared to question the gods of Toril on their design, and the gods, curious about the solitary mortal, deigned to answer him. Soon though, he returned to the sea, not finding anything like him, as he was a unique creature. It is then that he is said to have travelled with Sekala, until Sekala freed the first Sahawagan from their imprisonment in a giant clam shell. In Lost Sahawagan legend, he is thusly known as the one who swims with Sekala. All legends agree that during this time in Ikovas' life, he searched for love and acceptance in order to end the constant loneliness he felt. He eventually drew the eye of Umbali, who was fascinated by this creature who was not a god like her and thus immortal, but had a lust for adventure despite his mortality. Umbali was softer at the time, and her fascination turned to love. Iacovis loved her in return, finally having found the thing he searched for. She gave him many gifts, mostly precious metals and stones, but also godlike abilities, granting him power and immortality. Life then began to develop on land, and Iacovis wished those creatures to love him as Umbali did. He set foot on land again in what would eventually become known as the Land of Cholt. He used his new powers to conquer that land and erect a massive palace, 
While Umberly was away on other planes, Iacovus would return to his palace and inspire war between neighbouring kingdoms before stealing their mages' magic items. He grew greedy and became the epitome of gluttony, earning the title of Taker, as taking what belonged to others seemed to be the only thing he knew how to do. His harem numbered in the hundreds, but Umberly didn't care as long as he truly loved her and her alone. Not satisfied with that, Iacovus pretended to fall in love with one of his harem in order to make Umberly jealous and give him more attention. In Umberly's youthful naivety, she believed his feelings for the woman to be real, and she slew her. Iacovus was overjoyed at seeing his lover's reaction to his actions, thinking that he now controlled her. He didn't understand how hurt Umberly was, and paid for that mistake with his left eye, which Umberly tore out from his skull before leaving him in his palace. Not willing to kill him, but too hurt to stay. Ikovis brooded for thousands of years before scouring the world for magic items that he could use to take his revenge on a god. When it came time to attack Umberly, Iacovus discovered that he had drastically overestimated his ability and equipment. She shattered his bones, spilled his blood, and believing him dead, scattered his magic items across the seas of Faerun. Umberly didn't, however, count on the War of Three Leaves, which had just ended, causing the elves to emigrate into the inner sea, where they could find some of Iacovus's more powerful magical weapons. She almost succeeded in driving the elves from their new underwater home, but came just short, as she feared the elves found part of Iacovus's most powerful item, a magical eye that he'd replaced his missing one with. The part was stored in Mithnantar, just as the city's mythal was erected, but was lost somewhere in the city during the 10th Seros War when Sahawagan killed Mithnantar's last defenders. 650 years later, a Malenti priestess named La Quil, following ancient clues about the one who swims with Sekula, discovered a series of magma tunnels under the seabed northeast of Cholt. Inside she found an emaciated, one-eyed, heavily tattooed human who, thinking her a thief but confident that he was most likely the most powerful being she had ever met, spared her life so that she could help him restore him to his ancient glory. Holding her life in his hands, he forced her to spend two years explaining the intricacies of Sahuagan politics and everything she knew about the world before transmuting himself into a Sahuagan hatchling and having Laquil place him in her village's hatchery. He grew to adulthood and killed the prince of another Sahuagan settlement in a duel. Laquil's baron Huantan replaced the prince and Lyakovis was named baron of Laquil's village. Huantan then, with Iacovis' help, killed the king of Clarteros Sea, taking his place and putting Iacovis in his place as prince. Over the next few years, Iacovis and Laquil, his little Melenti, despite her new position in Sahuagan society as a high priestess, worked to recover many of his scattered magical items. Once Iacovis had taken enough wealth, he began to foster alliances, including buying the services of the pirate king of the Sea of Fallen Stars, Vergrom the Mighty, and the Murkoth, who were enemies of the Sea Devils. Iacovis' magic items made him even more powerful, though he still refused to share any of his plans with his favoured servants. With his allies and influence over King Huantan, a massed army of undersea monsters and pirates, he enacted a plan that had taken three years to prepare for, attacking the coastal city of Waterdeep in 1369 DR. At the climax of the war, Iacovis was killed at the hands of Jeric Wolfsket, a young paladin of Lathander. Where sharks covet powerful magical items, especially weapons suited to use underwater or on land, such as the trident. They believe they deserve such objects because of the supremacy of sharks as apex predators, and their rulership over sharks gives them a natural dominion over other sea creatures, including land creatures who venture into their domain. Where sharks are known to establish themselves as tyrannical lords of small islands, or become the most vicious of pirate captains. Where sharks lay claim to large stretches of the coast or open ocean around undersea mountains, so they don't tend to come into conflict with one another very often, preferring to give each other space. But when they do fight, the fearsome battle for dominance usually leaves one or either scarred or dead. One reason where sharks covet magic weapons is to defend themselves against their own kind. In underwater environments, where sharks often favour sunken ships laden with trunks and chests full of treasure. They're one of the worst threats to merfolk and sea elf communities and can be devastating to coastal villages that depend on fishing as the were-sharks drastically deplete fish stocks and wantonly murder fisherfolk, who will turn to anyone they can to help them, offering up whatever strange treasures 
they've dragged up from the depths over the years. Please hit the like button if you've made it this far. Subscribe if you like what I do. Check out my Patreon for all the full scripts for these videos. Buy some sweet merchandise from my Teespring shop. We're your geek with pride. And as always, thanks for listening. And I'll be back with more for you very soon. Thank you.